All right, praise God. Just a little minor glitch. We we reading out the Bible again today or something else? What's that? <laughs> yes, the Bible. Yes, of course. Oh, uh, praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Amen. Great uh, service last week and the move of God and uh, that was just amazing. And I think, you know, one of the things that uh, makes me realize too is that Every time, you know, uh, the Lord puts something on your heart to share with others or with somebody, we, I think we take it for granted so much that we don't realize it may not be for everybody. But if one person hears from God, you know what I'm saying? We're, it's the Word of God, so it's good. But I'm saying specifically, I think God speaks to individuals all the time. And sometimes we take that lightly and so we don't share what God has put on our heart or what we feel kind of motivated or moved or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's very subtle. I mean sometimes it's not like a big flash of light and God says thus saith the Lord speak this. No it may just be in a conversation and you don't even may not even realize like Sheila. She comes in with this beautiful word from the Lord that was so specific and so right on. I mean it you I, I swear, I was sitting there, I'm thinking, well, Don must have called her earlier in the week. Honestly, that's exactly what I was thinking. Don or Jane must have talked to her because it was literally word for word. It was amazing. And, you know, we're amazed, but that's God. That's what God does. And so I'm just saying, don't, and that's kind of what I want to talk to you about uh, as we go on this morning, but don't, don't diminish the authority that you have, the power that God wants to use you. I mean, that's, look, if she didn't say what God told her to say, it would have been a whole different thing. I'm not saying God wouldn't have moved and that he couldn't have still, but this was so specific that those girls, I mean, without having a, a huge history of, you know, spiritual encounters, had to know. Somebody must have told her something. You know what I mean? Because I, that's what I'm thinking, and I, I just heard about it five, ten minutes before, you know. So it was, it's amazing, and that's how God will confirm His Word. And you are the source or the means by which He wants to do this. So every day, all the time, there's opportunities that God wants to use you, and we just can't overlook it. We can't just take it for granted that, well, you know, that's just me, or who am I to be doing this, or whatever. You know, it's just God has a plan, and, and you're a part of it. Praise the Lord. So that was exciting, and I, I just, uh, I'm just really blessed of the Lord. Amen. To have been here and be a... Be a a witness to what God was doing. It was, it was great. Praise the Lord. And another thing, that's a seed sown in those girls that'll never go away. Oh, the enemy will try to rob it from them by giving them other junk to think about or to be fearful of. But they can always go back, just like Tim said. They can always go back to that time and know that that was something outside of the realm of the natural. You know, that was that just doesn't happen naturally. It, it had to be God. You know, so. That was, that was tremendous, praise the Lord. Yeah. Glory to God. God is great. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Hey, I've got a, I had a sign on my TV. Now, I'm not a huge geography 
buff, but I do know a little bit about the world and uh, some of the countries in it. But it, on my TV, it says, built in Antana. Where is that? Straight <laughs> up. Thank you. Speaking of antennas, two antennas met on a roof. They fell in love. They got married. The ceremony wasn't much, but the reception was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know what the difference is between a nicely dressed man on a tricycle and a poorly dressed man on a bicycle? Attire. <laughs> Okay, I'll quit with this. Cross-eyed teacher, couldn't control his pupils. <laughs> I know that's not politically correct, but it's true anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Amen. All right. James 1, 21. I just want to kind of do a little uh, contextual thing here to begin with. And uh, in James 1.21, he says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. And that word meekness is simply means humility. So what he's saying is you humble yourself in order to receive revelation, which means you can't let your intellect dominate. You have to humble your natural way of thinking or, or put it down below what the Spirit is trying to say. If, you know, if Sheila had tried to plan that, she couldn't have done it. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, this is nothing against Sheila. I mean, she's got a brain and she's capable of using it and does. And she's got some theology training. She went to Bible college and stuff. So she's, it isn't like she doesn't know the scripture or couldn't use it. It's just that to be that specific, it has to be God. Yeah. And she had to be willing, because she told me herself, and she, t she told all of us, I think I'm, j I just feel like I'm being redundant. You know, I'm just repeating stuff that we all know and on and on and on. And she had to, she had to submit to the spirit. She had to put her thoughts or her uh, opinions down in order for God to do what God wanted to do. And that's what we always have to do because we'll look at the situation or the circumstance and we'll say, well, you know, I'm not up to this. I, I'm not capable of this or I, this isn't anything new to say and blah, 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 blah. And all the time God is just saying, just shut up and let me do the talking. Quit thinking and let me do the work. Amen. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's why he has given us the Holy Spirit. So in order to receive revelation, in other words, in order for God to operate through us, we have to humble ourselves. And that doesn't mean to be self-abasing or anything. It just means put your intellect down and let the Spirit dominate. Let Trust God, in other words. Just trust that he knows what's gonna, what he's going to do, even if you don't. Because a lot of times you'll have this conversation. You'll walk away thinking, boy, that, sounded, that was about the dumbest thing I think I've ever said. Only to find out later that that person was really moved by something that you said. Because there was something they needed to hear, amen, that, God, that they had been crying out to God for or, or questioning their situation or their circumstance. And then God speaks directly to them through somebody who they would have never imagined he would. Praise the Lord. So, amen. Psalms 119 and 130 says, The entrance of the word brings light. It brings revelation. So when you release what God is wanting to say, there's revelation for somebody. And it may not be for everybody. But if one person is touched, it's worth it. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so 2 Corinthians now, chapter 5 and verse 17. You know, we sang this song about... Uh, in, in God and, and how God wants to work in us and we, he's closer to us than the skin on our bones and the breath in our lungs and so on and so forth and it's true and therefore if any man be in Christ he's a new creature old things are passed away behold all things are become new so if you're born again you are a new creature and everything that you were is gone as far as God's concerned and now you are this new creature amen and in in the definition of that actually is new in kind or new in quality one translation says a whole new species of man yeah. praise the Lord that's who we are yeah. but we've got to know just like these young girls they need to know who they are what who God says they are and that will change everything for them it's only when we get trapped in our 
human identity and what other people want to project on us and tell us that we are or in, uh, try to influence us that way, that we become subject to their influence. If you know who you are in God, stuff will just roll off you like water off a duck's back. Amen? It won't affect you the same way as it will if you don't understand who you are. All things, he said, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Praise the Lord. All right? So here's the Gospels. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are physically and naturally what happened to Jesus. You read it, and it's historic evidence or historic uh, accounts of physical things that actually took place. Right? Amen? It's what man saw in the flesh. It's, it's they wrote it down. They recorded what they saw, what they witnessed naturally. Amen? Now, there were miracles, but they're just recording what they saw. They're just recording the, the, the things that took place. Amen? Paul, when Paul begins writing, and he's the, 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 uh, writes the gospel of grace. Amen? Everything he's preaching is about grace. So when Paul begins to write in his letters, he's writing what happened in Christ. Okay? The gospels are talking about what happened to Christ or what Christ was doing. What Paul writes is what happened in in Christ. That's us. That's who we are. That's what we are. Or it's what God saw or what the Spirit witnessed. Understand what I'm saying? Paul had a revelation. Paul was knocked out. He was out cold. He said he went up to the third heaven. He saw things from a spiritual perspective. He saw it the way God saw it, and that's what he records. Okay? So every scripture where it says, in Christ... Right? Every scripture where it talks about in Christ is talking about who you are. All right? The, the Gospels are talking about who Jesus is. It's expressing and it's explaining who Jesus is. Paul's writing or telling you who you are in Christ. Amen? Or what you have in Christ. What belongs to you. What is yours? Amen? What's your possession? What is your inheritance? Amen? In Christ. That's what he's writing about. So look at John uh, 16, verses 12 through 13. John 16, 12 and 13. Jesus is speaking and he said, I've got lots of stuff I'd like to share with you. Amen. I, yet, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. These people had, Jesus is still alive. It's still the physical reality of Christ. No one has received the spirit of God because he hasn't died and sent back the spirit. So that's what he's telling them. I've got, there's so much I want to share with you. There's so much I want you to understand and to know, but I can't tell you now. You can't bear it. You wouldn't understand it. It would be a waste of time. Look at all the things that he says to his disciples, and we're reading it now post-Holy Ghost. Amen. And we're thinking, what is wrong with these dolts? I mean, what, why couldn't they figure this out? They didn't have the Spirit. They didn't understand three-fourths of what was going on. In fact, most of what happened, they didn't understand until after the book of Acts or until the book of Acts when the Spirit was poured out. Then it all, every, just like the two guys on the road to Emmaus, the Spirit comes, Jesus comes and begins to open up the Scripture to them. And it wasn't that they didn't know the Scripture, they just didn't understand it by the Spirit. And when Jesus begins to reveal it to them, to them they go, and then He spoke to us everything from Moses Amen. To up to the current time, right? And didn't our hearts burn within us? Or didn't we just feel like it all came alive to us? Yeah. Things that we had never understood before. He exposed it. The Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Jesus, revealed it to them. So he goes on to say then, how be it, or however, when he, the Spirit of truth, speaking of the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit of Christ, or God in you, however you want to call it, it's all the same is come, He will guide you into all truth. In other words, He's going to reveal things that you, even though you may have the, the intellectual understanding of it, you don't have it, it hasn't been revealed, it hasn't become revelatory to you yet, amen? When that Spirit comes, He'll guide you into all truth because He won't talk of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Amen? He's... It's not just about this. It is about this. But it's also about everything else in our life. He wants to show you things to come. He wants to reveal things to you that you won't be able to understand intellectually. But by the Spirit, he, it gives God opportunity to speak. Because He's not going to talk of... I'm not to talk of myself. 
Amen? That's what church does. That's what religion does. This is supposed to be speaking what God's saying or what Jesus saw or understood in the Spirit. Amen? So he says that uh, many things I want to tell you, not now. But when the Holy Ghost comes, this is what Paul teaches, what Jesus couldn't teach. Are you with me? It isn't a contradiction of anything. It's just that Jesus couldn't teach it because the Spirit hadn't come yet. Jesus knew it. He understood it because he had the Spirit. But it, he couldn't reveal it. He said, I got, there's this stuff I want to share with you, but I can't share it with you now. But after the Holy Spirit has come, he'll lead you and guide you into all truth. So that's, what, that's the difference between what the, the four Gospels and Paul's messages are. Paul is saying what Jesus couldn't say. Not because he couldn't say it, but because it would have been a waste of time for him to say it because nobody would have understood it. So Paul gets the revelation, and now Paul is saying what Jesus couldn't say. And that's what we're reading in the gospel. So I've, to I've told this before, but let me just share it with you for a minute. Because here's what happens. We know we have uh, who we are in Christ. It's, it's the same thing that Sheila shared with the girls in the handout that she gave. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am, I am, I am. All of these things that identify who I am in Christ, whom God has declared us to be, right? So what happens is we say that, yes, amen, praise the Lord, hallelujah, and then we get into a bind, we get into some situation that we can't quite figure out intellectually, and we fall back to the, to the old man. We go back to my ability to overcome this. Even if it's just disciplining my mind, I'm not going to think this, you know, I'm not going to... But when, when that's not what he's trying to get us to do, he's trying to get us to rest in the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit can tell us what to say, what to do, how to react to the situation and the circumstances. Amen? Are you, am I making it clear? Amen? So here's the deal. When I was a kid, I loved to swim. And that, back in those days, there, uh, there weren't a lot of swimming pools. All the towns that have them now didn't have them. So you had to go to Des Moines. I lived in a little town, Bondurant at the time, and it was only about 300 people. But if we went to Altoona during the summertime, one day out of the week, there was a bus, a school bus, that would take the kids that wanted to go to what they used to call East Town Pool, and then it became Teach Out, and now it's just a water park next to a library. But that was one of the first pools around that were close enough for us to go to. So we'd go there, and you'd take swimming lessons. And I thought I could swim, you know, because I swam in three, four foot of water without drowning. So I thought I could swim. Well, one day, I went with my brother and some other kids, and my mother just dropped us off at the pool, you know, and you go in and do your thing, get in the pool, and away you go. So I was telling him, I can swim, you know, because I've had swimming lessons. You know, I do the dog paddle, the Australian crawl, you know, the whole stuff. I, I, I mean, I know this. So he shoved me in the water. But it was like eight foot of water. It wasn't clear in the deep end, but it was way over my head at the time. I was probably five foot tall, maybe that, if that. And uh, I was making the moves you know, like a swimmer, but I was sinking like a rock. And I did, I sunk, and they had to yank me out. The lifeguard literally had to come pull me out, which was more embarrassing than if I had drowned, probably. But, <laughs> but my brother said, you need to go back to take some more lessons. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So I'm making all these swimming motions, but I'm sinking. Now, that's exactly what happens to us as Christians, as believers. <clears throat> we... We, we say, I, you know, I get it. I'm, I've got the revelation. I understand. It's what I say, so on and so forth, right? And then we get thrown in the deep end. You know, then we get into a mess. Then we get into a really deep, troubling, problem situation. And we're making all the right moves. I'm saying what I'm supposed to say, right? But I'm sinking. I'm still going under, amen? I, my theology's right. Okay, so I've got the motions down, but it really hasn't gotten down inside of me to where it's natural for me, where, where I'm not panicking, where I'm not freaking out, where I'm not just going through the motions and not getting results. You see what I'm saying? So what that tells us is go back and take the lessons. Go back to the lessons. Go back to what the Word of God says, and that's what you have to work on. That's what you have to focus on. It's nothing to be ashamed of. All it did was reveal to me something that I needed revealed to me. 
before I jumped in a pool somewhere by myself or got into a lake or into a pond or something, because we used to go out in the country and swim in these farm ponds that were, you didn't know what you were in. It might be two feet in one place and 20 feet in the next. And so I, I needed a wake-up call. And for my brother, it was kind of like, you know, I'd rather see you sink here where there's somebody here to help you than sometime when you're off by yourself just, you know, thinking you can do something you can't do. And that's what the Holy Spirit is for. He'll test us. He'll try us, not, not to harm us, but to, when the situation comes, he's saying, okay, where are you? You know, are you a swimmer or aren't you a swimmer? Are you, or are you just somebody who makes emotions and sinks like a rock when the problem comes? Now, we've all experienced this, and that's, I'm not saying it to belittle anybody because I deal with the same thing. But I'm saying what God is trying to get across to us is we have to have this settled, who we are in Christ. This has to become a reality, not just some intellectual understanding, but something that actually works in our life when we get in the deep end. You understand what I'm saying? When we get into the mess, we know what to do instinctively, right? Because if it's not instinctive, it, it be. Panic is what results. It's just like in the military. When they train you, you go through boot camp, you go through infantry training, you go through advanced infantry training, and then you go through staging battalion, and then you get into combat. The reason for all of that training, which becomes so repetitious and so boring and so frustrating, it's just a lot of hard work that you get fed up with, until you actually get into combat, and then you react instinctively. You're not having to, oh, what am I going to do? You know. Because you're going to be afraid. There's going to be fear. There's going to be anxiety. There's going to be all these things. So you better know instinctively what your next move is or you're not going to have a next move. And that's what God's trying to get across to us. Amen? So with that in mind, let's look at this. Matthew chapter 12, 10 through 13. Matthew 12, verse 10 through 13. <clears throat> Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like as the other. All right, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 15. And he gave some apostles and some prophets, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 1 verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So, we have saw a little bit here about what, what God is trying to explain to us, who we are, what we are. But we are all ministry. We're all kings and priests. There are pastors, teachers, all, all these different things. But we are all ministers. Every one of us. Now, symbolically, the hand is a picture of the fivefold ministry, right? Because there are five ministries, gifts that are listed uh, in Ephesians, okay? But the scripture also connects the ministry to this hand. So the scripture itself actually connects with the hand being about ministry, all right? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20. And it says that the, the angels of the church... The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in, thy, in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. That word angels also translates min messengers or ministers. Amen. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the messengers to the churches are in his right hand. 
So it connects, again, with, with the hand, right? So the body of Christ, the Scripture says, has many members, all of them with different functions, and yet all of them are kings and priests, yet all of them are ministers. Ministering spirit, the, the Spirit of God is in us to minister. Praise the Lord. Amen. So I want to I look at the function of the hand. And uh, the Scripture says, don't say to the hand, I have no need of you. In other words, don't say to ministry, I don't need it. You don't have a choice. That is your purpose. That's why you're here, is to be a minister of the Word of God. To be a king and priest. To have dominion, to be a king, but also to be a priest who shares, amen, the Word. That shares the truth of God. Alright? So, in Matthew chapter 12, this withered hand pictures a powerless ministry. Now, I don't want to step on toes, but I'm saying that's where the church is today. Amen. For the most part, it's this powerless ministry and powerless saints that no longer have the ability to minister or get sheep out of the pit. That's what happened here last Sunday. We had sheep in a pit, and somebody needed to, to minister to get them out. Now, the Holy Ghost wants to do that. And that's why he worked it out so perfectly to show this is what you're about. This is what you're supposed to be. This is what you do. The only thing that's going to help these two young girls, or Catherine especially, is God's going to have to get connected with her. And she's going to have to know that God is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Praise the Lord. So Matthew chapter 12, verse 10. And behold, there was a man who had this hand withered. And they ask him, saying, it's lawful to heal on the Sabbath days, that they might accuse him. So this hand is withered. So it, it, it's, uh, it doesn't have any power. It's ineffective. Praise the Lord. Matthew 12, verse 11. And behold, there was a man. So he said unto them, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? Obviously, Jesus isn't talking about some barnyard animal here. Amen. That's not, that isn't the focus here. But he's talking about something that's much bigger, something that has spiritual significance. Praise the Lord. He's talking about the people, amen, that we shepherd. And we think of it, we always try to dumb that down to just a pastor in a church or something. But no, you all have a flock. You all have people that you influence. You all have people that God puts in your life and in your path and in your job and in your family and, and uh, you know, relationships in your neighborhood. Whatever it might be. That's the flock. That's the flock that He has given you. Praise the Lord. And so He's talking about people here that are shepherds over a flock. And they are His people. Amen. These people that you're shepherding are His people and the sheep of his pasture. Praise the Lord. You are the, you're the shepherd, but they're the sheep of his pasture. He's the one that put them here. He's the one that wants them redeemed. He's the one, the one that wants them connected with him. Praise the Lord. Matthew 12, 12. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. So the people are in a pit. And the reason they're in a pit is because ministry is not flowing from the finished work of the cross, which is what the Sabbath is representing here. Jesus is the Sabbath. All right? And, the, and because ministry is not flowing from Jesus, from our understanding of Him in us and us in Him, then it is powerless and it's withered. Are you with me? Praise the Lord. If you understand who you are in Christ and who that Christ is in you, you will not be powerless. But if you don't understand it, your ministry is just human. It's just effort. It's just good deeds. It's just wanting to do good, but you can't influence that way. Your influence has to be by the Spirit of God. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. That's the difference. When you have a conversation with somebody who's unsaved and you just try to give them religion, it's stupid. It makes no sense to them. 
Now, to you, it makes perfect sense because it's the power of God unto salvation. You know what it can do. You know what it is. But you have to do it by the Spirit and not by the letter of the law. Amen? Now, Sheila mentioned uh, this last week. A lot of what's uh, being preached is political issues, uh, self-help programs, uh, psychological manipulation, and, and just empty rhetoric. Amen? With no real biblical, spiritual basis to it. All right? So it shouldn't surprise us that sheep have fallen into a pit. All right, Proverbs 23, 27. A whore is a deep ditch, and a strange woman is a narrow pit. Now, we're all adults up here, so if I get a little... Uh... <sighs> Praise the Lord. This isn't about some whore on a street corner. It's about a harlot religious system that is totally flesh-focused, self-indulgent. Amen? It's entertainment-based, man-centered, a religious system that's in competition to see who can build the best whorehouse in town. So they moan. I mean, come on, t turn on Christian TV. I'm not saying it's all that way, but a lot of it is just all, it just is so phony. And so about somebody, some man, some ministry, some woman. You know what I'm saying? So they moan and groan for an hour on Sunday morning, as long as the money's on the table when you leave. Praise the Lord. That's what he's talking about here, church. So if I'm sounding a little bit explicit, I'm just trying to say what he is really, the spirit is really trying to tell us. Amen. So people, they leave the biggest little whorehouse in Des Moines, you know, or whatever it might be, right? Feeling used, feeling disappointed, feeling abused, never really having that longing, the desire satisfied the real desire that they have they come wanting intimacy with Jesus and they leave never having really encountered him they are pointed to a religion instead of a relationship to the law instead of love and they experience a momentary uh, excitement right mm -hmm. but no real fulfillment and that comes from being in a marriage relationship with Jesus. It's not just getting something. It's getting Him. It's being one with Him. They learn how to practice safe church. And the result is they're in a pit. The real purpose of the fivefold ministry is to develop and mature the new creation man. This new creature. You are a new creature the moment you're born again, but it has to be developed. It has to be matured. That's the renewing of the mind. Acts 1, uh, 4 through 8. See, here's, here's our idea of church. Look at me. Isn't that special? It's entertainment. It's, it's a distraction. It's something to just, you know, look over here. I'm always doing magic tricks for my grandkids. I had them over the other night, and I was, you know, the quarter that disappears. You all know that. And shop and pick it up, and then, and then I find it in their hair and their ears and all that kind of stuff. The card tricks, you know, where you spread the cards, pick a card. Take the cards, put it back in there. You're looking at the, the, you know, the card that's just above it. Put it back in. You spend, the next card I turn over is going to be your card. They're just fascinated. They think I'm Mandrake the magician. You know, they, they think I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I want them to keep thinking that until they figure me out. And, <laughs> but, but meanwhile, that's what we do. That's what happens in church. There's this 
look over here, don't pay any attention to what's happening. What's happening over here? People are dying. People are, are being lost. People are falling in pits. People are being destroyed. And we're over here going, look at the, don't we have a great choir? I mean, isn't this church something? I mean, look at the size of this baby. And, uh, you know, we're going to give away three bicycles and a, you know, a moped this weekend. I mean, it's all about everything except what the need is. And people just feel like, Okay, I got a little excitement because somebody shouted and hollered a little bit and I felt pretty good. And then you leave and you feel empty. You feel like you've just been ripped off. You feel like you've been used. You went looking for love and what you got was a cheap experience that didn't really represent love at all. Just entertainment, just a distraction. Praise the Lord. So in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, he says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So Jesus began this work. In fact, if you back up a couple of verses, he said the old Theophilus is telling them all the works that Jesus began to do. So the, he's begun this work, and then he hands the work to us. But you have to have the Holy Spirit in order to do it. That's why he told his disciples, go wait. You, there's no point in me giving you a, a, a job a, a offer here because you're not capable of handling it until the Holy Spirit comes. Once the Holy Spirit comes, you can start doing what I've been doing. Then you will bear witness of me. In other words, you'll, you'll, people will say, hey, there must be a Jesus. These people are followers and look what they're doing. Look at the miracles that are taking place. Look at the lives that are being transformed. Amen. So it has to be by the Holy Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is restoration is an ongoing objective. In other words, it's something that has to be ongoing. It doesn't just happen one time. You don't just get the Holy Spirit, amen, and then just think everything's going to be perfect. And if you've lived at all any time being saved, you know that's the truth. Because you can be full of the Holy Ghost and also full of all kinds of problems. So God is trying to tell us there is a process here, amen, where you learn to let the Holy Spirit do the work. Amen. And you rest in that finished work. In other words, you just go with the flow. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. Trust God when you're in those situations. Amen. John 4 verse 14. He's telling, Jesus is telling this woman about something that's going to come. Again, he's, we're seeing a physical act take place here. But then Paul comes along and explains it later. So he says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The Holy Spirit wasn't being poured out, although that's what he's talking about. They didn't understand it. You know they didn't because the woman says, you don't even have a bucket. What are you talking about? How are you going to get water? So she's still thinking totally natural, just what she's seeing in the natural. Then Paul comes along and tells us that God, he has a supply if you're thirsty. Amen? You've got you to gotta want, you got to go to the well, in other words. You, you, if you want the water, you've got to go to the well. If you're thirsty, you'll go to the well. Revelation 21, verses 4 through 6. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. He that sat upon the throne saith, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha, Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Again, the Spirit of God is what he's talking about. See, God keeps restoring us. It isn't a one-time thing. It's a continuous, ongoing event. Praise the Lord. He wants to give us something that is far greater than religion. Something that's greater than human skill. Something that's greater than intellect. David said, I'm wiser than all my teachers. 
Did he mean that he had a higher IQ? No, it just means he understood the substance, the essence, the, the spirit of what God was doing, and they didn't. It's like going to a theology class at a university somewhere. They give you all the theology and more than you'll ever want. But they have no concept of what the Spirit is about. So you, don't, you go away empty. You go away with some knowledge, but it's worthless. It, it, it's knowledge that isn't going to get you anything unless you want to be a theology professor somewhere, right? So Christ is the fulfillment of all of the promises that God has ever made. Yes. Amen. There, there, there's nothing more than Him. And we have Him. We are in Him. He is in us. Praise the Lord. So when we trust Him, when we are in Him, and that means you can, you can be born again and not be in Christ, if you understand what I'm saying. Now, I mean, I'm not saying you're not born again, and I'm not saying you're not in Christ. I'm saying your awareness of, the, of that reality is not there. So you're not really living as though it's, it's like you're, uh, you know, an heir to a multi-million heir, but don't know it. Don't know he's your daddy, right? So you, you, you're just, it, it doesn't do you any good. Amen? So when we trust him, when we recognize that we are in him, that we, he is in us, we become the land, amen, that flows with milk and honey. Praise the Lord. He is the promised land. Amen? And when we are in him and he's in us, things just flow. Stuff just happens. Praise the Lord. They didn't have to do anything to get the milk and the honey. They just had to be there. They had to be in that place. Amen. And it flowed. Right? Amen. Matthew 6 uh, verse 33. And I know I'm just, just teaching this morning, but that's all right. We need this. We, look, I don't know if this church will ever be full of people, but I do know you're going to encounter more people than we could ever get in this church in your life. Amen. Probably in a month's time, you'll have it, the people that are here will have more interaction with people than we could ever get in this building. Doesn't mean I don't want to fill it up. It doesn't mean I don't want to see more people here. It's just that we can't make this the end all of the be all of what this is about because that's not what it's about. It's about God being in us. God wanting to do every day what he did here last Sunday. It's a big deal to us because we don't see it every day when we should be seeing it every day. God wants us to experience that because it's the only way we can have the influence that we're supposed to have. Most of us came from denominational types of churches. And we know we went out. I had a guy knock my door yesterday. If he'd have been 20 minutes later, I wouldn't have even talked to him. But it, it wasn't game time yet. It was 20 minutes till 11. Amen. I hesitated. Honestly, I did. And then I felt like the Holy Ghost say, and I'm just, I, you get people come. You know, they're selling stuff. They're collecting for a baseball team or, you know, the whatever. And I'm not, a, you know, against trying to help them out if I got a few bucks or something. But, but I figured that's just what it is. It's another. And I, you know, go come back some other time, you know. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, don't be a jerk. Open the door and talk to the guy. So it was a young guy, probably in his 30s, with a, with a girl about eight, nine years old with him. And he said, and he had a little iPad with him or something. And he says, could I share a scripture with you? I said, oh, no, I'm done now. I'll be here all day. This guy's probably a preacher. How will I get rid of him? And I said, okay, yeah, sure. And so he read from 2 Timothy and about the end times, you know, and people being lovers of selves and haters of, you know, the family and so on and so forth. And he asked me, he said, well, does, what, does that say anything to you? Does that resonate with you at all? Or what does that mean to you? And I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> I said, well, I think it means that, in my mind at least, I said, it means that uh, the world's, you know, a mess. And... Only people who are believers are going to be able to influence that mess. And the only way we can do that is by being like Jesus, which means we've got to love these people that are trying to destroy themselves and us and the whole world at the same time. God is love. And, you know, I talked for a few minutes, like you might imagine. And uh, I said, so, I mean, that's what it means to me. But I, I felt almost as energized at that time time in that 10 minutes or so that I was talking with this guy and his daughter as I did throughout the Iowa Hawkeye game. Now you got to know me. You, you think you know me, but you don't know me, believe me. I'm, uh, I got the, one hand is in a fist like this, sitting in this, I got this big old brown chair upstairs where I, it's my man, upper man cave where I watch the ball games. And uh, 
my other hand's holding an ink pen because I've been writing some stuff down. Now, I can't do anything with either one of them as long as the game's going on. I know, I know you think, this guy's insane. No, I get so superstitious. Now, I'm not a superstitious person normally, but when the game is on, I don't want talking. I don't want somebody coming and asking me questions. What's the score? Not now, not now. No. What channel is it on? I won't even answer until the next commercial break, you know. I mean, it's horrible. I know. I know it's crazy, and I know it at the time when I'm doing it, but I can't not do it. Because, come on, they're dependent on me. These are the Hawkeyes. You know, I'm serious. And I, and, and I even feel, you know, if, if my hand feels funny, then I, I'm thinking, oh, oh, this isn't good. You know, because I'm not gripping it right, or I feel a fingernail here, and I shouldn't be feeling it. I didn't feel it before in the first quarter. Why am I feeling it now? You know, and all these, it's insane. I know it is. But that's how it is. I mean, they've won six games, and it's because of me. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, that's how I feel about it. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying. If you're a fan, fan is just short for fanatic. That's all it is, and I am. I mean, I get, I got to be in the right position, and I mean, if I'm feeling, you know, like a little bit awkward or something, I, I'm thinking, uh-oh, this is not good. Quick, quick, commercial break. Do something so I can readjust here and get it back where I'm supposed to be. I'm just saying... <laughs> We do have influence. Now, I don't have that influence over the Hawkeyes, although I'd argue with you if it was game day. But now I'm kind of back in my right mind for a little while. But that's how it is. I mean, that's how I feel. I have this influence. I have this ability to affect people that are, you know, 200 miles away, you know, that don't even know me, wouldn't know me if they saw me, wouldn't know me wouldn't, no matter what, and yet I'm thinking this, you know. This is what I'm saying. If we could package that same sense of urgency or sense of purpose in our relationship with people. Now what I'm saying is, I get literally tense. I mean, I'm, everything's hyped up. Everything is going faster than it ever would normally under any normal circumstances. That's how I felt talking to that guy and his daughter. It was as though it were the Hawkeye's you know, and it's, they're up by three points. There's five minutes left, and the other team's got the ball. I mean, that's Nathan time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's where I make the difference. But I'm saying, I, that's what I was feeling just talking to this guy and his daughter about the Lord. So, that's God. That's God. He's alive. He's alive. He's operating. He's there. He's, he's wanting to be experienced. He's wanting to be noticed and, and uh, have us be aware of it. Amen. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what God wants to do in all of our interactions with other people. He wants them to know something is different here. Not me. Not that I'm any different. But there's something about this God that he's talking about that makes me think differently than I think any other time. Right? That's what God wants to do. That's what He wants to do. But if, you, if you're not conscious of it, if you're not, you know what I'm saying, if you're not believing it, that you have that influence, you won't have the influence. Not because you don't have the ability to, but you've got to know. You've got to believe that your feeling, your emotion, your b b being uh, you know, influenced to say certain things is God. And that it's going to have an impact, that it's going to make a difference. I know it, it sounds as crazy as me and the fists, you know, in the chair watching the Hawkeyes. But it's because, for whatever reason, in those moments, as irrational as it might be in the natural, it makes perfect sense to me. Right? And that's, I know, I'm, it's a stretch here to get this to where I'm trying to go. But I'm just saying, that's the way we should feel about our interaction with other people. We should feel like we have this kind of power because of God to influence, to affect, to change, to make different, amen, than what it would be otherwise without us. Yeah. Do I make any sense? You're all going to think, yeah, this guy needs therapy. I know it, but I can't afford it, praise the Lord. I'm just saying, there is so much power in each one of us that we go through life as though we had no impact on anything except what we can come up with intellectually in an argument to, why, to try to win an argument or something. It's not that at all. This, this is spiritual. 
This isn't the, the witnessing of the physical Jesus. This is the experiencing of the power of the resurrection of Christ, of the Spirit of Christ that He has given us to operate, to live this way. Amen? If I can be that crazy about a ball game, why would I hesitate? Amen? To, to, to feel the same way about how God's wanting to influence a life that's more than a ball game. That's more than just a fleeting three hours in time. But it's going to affect eternity. Praise the Lord. So Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Right? So the reason we don't always see all these things added to us isn't because we don't believe for the things. Because we do. Amen? But it's not believing under righteousness. Right? Yeah. The, the reason we're not getting the things isn't because we're not believing for the things. The reason we're not believing or getting the things is because we're not believing in the righteousness. We're not believing in the impact and the influence that we have. So we just go around like beggars, begging God to give us something that He's already declared is ours if you would just believe in your righteousness. If you would just believe in the influence that you have in the spirit realm. And everything in this world has to come from the spirit realm. It doesn't get here without it being brought here. Praise the Lord. And that's where we come in. Amen. Christ in us. If we understand Christ in us, our righteousness, the Holy Spirit, amen, everything else will flow like milk and honey. Amen. It'll flow, amen, like it's coming out of the promised land, which is Christ in us. Amen. The kingdom of God is in you. Amen. This land that flows with milk and honey, this promised land, is inside of you. You have it. It's part of who you are. It's part of your identity. Amen. If we did that, we'd be like those two spies, right? The two spies that came back and they said, hey, we've been in the promised land. We witnessed this, man. This kind of like what... What we just saw here last Sunday. That's what, that would be our testimony as the two spies. We come, hey, we've been over there. <laughs> Man, we've seen some fruit. It's huge. We saw what God can do. We've seen the miracle of God. We've seen the, the fruit. And it's so big. It's so huge. Amen. It's, it's just, uh, you won't believe what God can do. You won't believe the fruit. Amen. It's over in that land. It's in that place. It's in that person. It's in that reality. Amen. You just need help to carry it. That's faith. That's belief. Amen. Belief in the Holy Spirit. Praise God. That's when we become exporters. Amen. Instead of consumers. You know, look, I'm not picking on anybody because I know everybody has lives outside of the church and they've got stuff they've got to do. They've got jobs. They've got family and all that. So I'm not doing that. And you know I don't do that. But church, when it becomes just about me or just about you, you're not exporting anything. You're just a consumer. And when people just feel like, well, you know, it doesn't matter if I'm there or if I'm not there, right? Well, sometimes you can't be here. I get that. You've got other obligations. You've got church. You've got family. You've got, you know, vacation stuff. I, I'm not picking on that. I'm just saying our attitude can become, it's just about me. It's just what am I going to get? Not what have I got to give. Right? That's why we share the way we share in this church. I know it's not comfortable for everybody, especially for visitors come. They, they, they think it's awkward, I think. And, and they think, what are these idiots talking about? And no, they're, they're trying to share something that God has put on their heart or they feel like God wants this said. Now, it may not be for everybody, you know, but it's for somebody or it wouldn't be on you to say it. Whether they jump up and down and shout and say, Praise the Lord, that was for me, brother. Doesn't mean they didn't receive something. Doesn't mean they didn't get the seed. Doesn't mean they didn't get the benefit of what God was trying to do. Because if God put it on your heart, it's because He knew somebody was going to be there that He wanted to speak to. And He can't speak to them unless you open your mouth. Unless you do it. It's you that has the kingdom. It's you that has the, the, the power. It's you that has the anointing. It's you that has the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. It's called exporting instead of just consuming. John chapter 16, uh, 12 through 14. John 16, 12 through 14.
I have yet many things. Again, here's what Jesus said. I, I, he says, there's all kinds of stuff I want to tell you, but you can't bear them now. But when the Spirit of truth has come, He'll guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of Himself. Whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak. He'll show you things to come. So He's only going to say what God is saying or what God is thinking. Sheila, on Monday or Tuesday, when she texted me and asked if she could open, I said, sure, I'll call Tim. And I text Tim, forgetting that they were going to be out of town that weekend anyway. Right? So I said, you know, it's okay with you. Sheila's got something she wants to share. I didn't know what it was. I didn't even ask her. I just figured you know, she must have something or she wouldn't be wanting to get up here. So <laughs> praise the Lord. That was a week, almost a week in advance, right, before Jane texts Sally Sunday morning saying, you know, we got this thing and we'd like to, you know, see what God wants to do. Amen. Then they come, and then Don and I talked, and he shared with me this, the same thing. And uh, I told Suzanne a little bit about it, and that was it. We didn't really talk to anybody else about it. I mean, Doak was here and his wife, Becky, but other than that, everybody else was kind of wondering what, <laughs> what's going on, I imagine. But it was God, because the moment she began to speak, I said, oh, Lord, this is a God thing. It, that's what God wants to do in all of our life. Because look, when He, the Holy Spirit, comes, He'll lead you and guide you into all truth. In other words, He'll show you how to do this. He'll, he'll do it in a way that it will work in the truth. Not just, you know, some plan that we come up with. That's why I said to Don, I don't know if God had said to you, here, do this or do that. But I'm kind of just hearing about it and I'm thinking, I don't really know what to do. I mean, we can pray for Him for sure. But I want to know what God wants to do. Not just what seems natural to us. And that's why Don said, let's just let the Holy Ghost take it. And sure enough, he did. We let him. Right? We didn't try to figure it out. We didn't try to intellectualize the process. And, you know, if we do this, or 10 minutes of this, and 15 minutes of that, maybe. No, we, in fact, you know, we stumbled through the other stuff just like we always do. And it didn't, have, it didn't change a thing. God just did what God wanted to do. Because we let him. Amen? Amen. John 6 uh, verse 63. See, it wasn't effort. It, there was no effort on our part. That's my point. Just God had a plan. All we had to do was cooperate. All we had to do was not get in the way. Not, not try to make something out of it that he didn't want to make. And in fact, the very fact that it was Sheila opening made that possible. We couldn't, we couldn't get in the way of it because there wasn't anything to do until she was done. So you see what I'm saying? I mean, because, I, hey, you know, I can get in the way just like anybody else can. You know, because you think, well, you know, the Word of God, after all. No. He had something specific and a time to do it where there would not be anything there to, to conflict with it. Where it would just be God. There wasn't time for anything to be figured out and worked out. Amen. It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit in their life. It's the Spirit that gives the life. It's the Spirit that makes it come alive. Not our desire, not how much we want it. Because believe me, I'm looking at grandparents here who want nothing but the very best for their grandchildren. The same as I do, the same as anybody here would, right? But we can't always do it. No matter what we do, we try to do stuff to make it better. But our desire, our wanting good results, doesn't always have the results that we're looking for. But God always gets the results. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So again, we live in a time when the system of religion has put man on center stage. It's about this ministry, this guy's ministry, that guy's ministry. We, we run all over creation to go, I've done it, to be in this particular service, to get some anointing or something that I thought, you know, was because that's what they preached, I assumed that's what was going to happen. Amen? I'm just saying, the natural guy doesn't get this. Your intellect will argue with you about it all the time. It'll cause you to not even bring it up for fear that you'll just make a fool out of yourself or be embarrassed for even bringing it up. Amen? 1 Corinthians 
Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual. So God knows what the spiritual need is. He's got the spiritual. See what I'm saying? We know that there's a spiritual need, but we usually end up giving them flesh, end up giving them something carnal, thinking that if we give them enough carnal, I'm not talking negative carnal, I'm talking about good deeds, love them, hug them, tell them all the good stuff that we can tell them, and, but it won't work. Because the Spirit is trying to speak to the Spirit. The Spirit knows what that spiritual need is. We just think we know, and the Spirit's the only one that can really address it the way it's supposed to be addressed. That's why we have to let the Holy Spirit do what only the Holy Spirit can do. Amen? 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. The withered hand, see, it needs restoration. The ministry, our ministry, needs to be restored. It needs to go back. We talk about the book of Acts. The reason the book of Acts was so influenced, uh, the, the, the reality of the book of Acts was so uh, effective and so influential is because they were operating this way. They were literally letting the Holy Spirit lead. Well, didn't read what Paul says. You know, I wanted to go over here and do some stuff, and it was the right thing to do. He wanted to go have an evangelistic outreach in this territory, and the Holy Spirit said, don't go. Now, most of us would have said, yeah, that's the devil. I mean, God wants revival. That's the devil lying to me. Right? Because our intellect would tell us, come on, God wants revival. He wants everybody to be saved, right? But Paul was operating by the Spirit. He knew, look, if this is God, he'll open a door. Something will happen. Something will take place that I'll know it's God. And until that happens, I'm not messing with it. Because it will only bring problems. It will only create issues. How many of you ever tried to witness somebody and ended up almost in a fight? Right? Because they, they're angry. They don't want to hear about God. They're not there. They're not in the place where they need to be for God's spirit to influence. When they are in that place, just like Tim said, how many times, you know, we witness to people over their life? Nothing. Don't want nothing to do with it. That's all a bunch of garbage. Keep it to yourself. Blah, 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 blah. When they're laying on that deathbed, Amen. Or their loved one or somebody else. You'd be amazed at how open all of a sudden the Spirit begins to deal with them. They're open. And you could say the same thing that they would have laughed at and mocked you for a month before and with open arms. Weeping. Because of the Spirit of God. This ministry here, it's talking about more than preaching ministry. It's speaking of being a dispenser, a communicator of the Spirit. Amen? We are to dispense. We are to communicate the Spirit of God to other people. The New Covenant. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. God has deposited in us the Spirit of truth. The means by which God can touch lives and impact people and the world. Amen? That treasure is God Himself. It's how God communicates in this earth through you and me, through people, through humans. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 through 18. I'll hurry up here, wrap it up. Praise the Lord. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is in the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about the body, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, 
that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which are alive, or we which live, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, which we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Praise the Lord. Amen. Colossians 1, 26 and through 28. 1, 26 through 28. He said he wants to perfect us or bring us to a place of maturity or perfection. Amen. Even the mystery which has been hid from the ages from generations but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. That word perfect means mature, means to be grown up. So you're a new creature, but we need to be mature new creatures. Amen. Paul says in verse 29, he said, I also labor striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Not Paul's working. Not that Paul said, I'm, I'm the chiefest of sinners. He said, I've, I've, I've not arrived. I've pressed towards the mark. But he tells us here, it's his working. It's God working, which worketh in me mightily. Why? Because he lets it. Because he allows it. Because he's conscious of it. Amen. This secret, amen, has been hidden. It's been veiled over. Amen. It's the mystery that God is making manifest in and to and through the saints, through us. Praise the Lord. That's what's been veiled. This is the mystery, Christ in you. Praise the Lord. The hope of glory, the hope of revelation, the hope of seeing the manifestation of God in this earth. That's what people are hungry for. They're not looking for a whore. They're not looking for some prostitute. They're looking for love. They're looking for a relationship. They're looking for a lifetime marriage. To Jesus Christ. And we're selling them short. We're giving them some hooker off the street. To use that analogy. And think that's going to satisfy them. No it just makes them feel dirty. And cheated and used. And we wonder why. They don't embrace Christ. Ephesians 4. 11 through 15. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head even Christ. See, God's going to heal the withered hand. He's going to mature the people. The people through whom He can reveal Jesus Christ. Romans eight nineteen through 21. We know this, we've read it plenty of times, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Amen. So the whole creation is waiting for the withered hand to be restored. God is not going to manifest us. We manifest him. Praise the Lord. Religion says becoming a son of God, becoming born again, is having superman ability. You just step into a phone booth and jump out and you leap tall buildings with a single bound. You know, you are more powerful than a locomotive, faster than a speeding bullet. That's not what we're supposed to be looking for. 
these things will be added. We're supposed to be looking for God. We're supposed to be looking for the influence that God can have. Amen? Jesus said, I can't do anything. It's the Father that's in me. He's doing the work. He said, I'm only going to say what I hear Him say. He never talked about, you know, I can leap tall buildings in a single bound. No, if he had to, he'd walk on water. He didn't brag about it. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to walk on water. They just see him walking on water. He needed to because they needed to have an experience in faith. They, had, they needed to understand what faith was about, right? It's about being restored to an original condition as sons of God, as God in us. Believe me, the miracles will happen all by themselves. If you'll do and go where the Holy Spirit asks you to go and, says, and say what He says, the miracles will take care of themselves. The things will happen. The, the stuff will happen. God just needs somebody to make Him accessible so that the Spirit can do what the Spirit does. See, you know what? Are you, are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? Because I've been in church and I've been around church and Pentecostals and all the other stuff. And it's been about this guy's anointing. It's been about if you could get into his service. If you could, you know, if, if you just fast long enough or if you just preach loud enough or if you just do this or do that. And we've missed it so many times. We've hit it a few times, but by accident. In spite of us, not because of us most of the time. But if we just would listen to the Holy Spirit. God already has a plan. He already knows what He wants to do. Just show up and let me do it. Sheila did not know what this message was about. She didn't have a clue. She just told it because that's what she felt God wanted her to do. She felt it was redundant. She felt it was a waste of time. She felt it was just repetition. It was just repeating things. I mean, that's what was going on in her intellect. But she was obedient to the Spirit. You see what I'm saying? That's the thing we need to do. Quit worrying about what is it, what's it going to sound like. What are they going to think? Who cares? Let God be God. And watch what the results are. Sheila didn't come down here and, you know, jump and shout and spit in their face, you know, and do all these other things. No, she just said, and it set the stage. It opened them up to a place where then when they come over here, the Holy Spirit has already interceded, has already affected them to where they walked away from there. And I'll tell you, I saw them. I talked to them right there, looked them in the face. Two beautiful young girls. But when they come back away from this altar and I saw them, in the, they were like two different faces. Beautiful, but almost a glow. And you could tell they'd been crying, but it wasn't the kind of crying that you see when somebody's grieving, it's this kind of a, just, ah, it's over. You know, I can relax. It's, the battle is won. I mean, it, I'm not saying they verbalized it that way, but I'm saying that's what it looked like. That's, that's what I was seeing. Praise the Lord. God does the work. He restores. Matthew 12, verse 10. We're almost done here. One couple more scriptures here. We'll Matthew 12, 10 again, he says, is it right to do this on this day? And here's, here's what I, the Holy Spirit is saying to me. Is it right to do this today? Look at Hebrews 3, verses 13 and 15. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. If you want to see God move, you've got to be soft hearted. In other words, you've got to be open to what God is wanting to do. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 7. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Sabbath. Praise the Lord. Jesus is the Sabbath. You've got to yield to him. You've got to let him have his way. Amen? Today, 
I swear we need to get up every day and say it like this. Today, I'm going to manifest Christ. Not religion, not me, not my theology, not man, but Jesus. I'm looking for an appearing, praise the Lord. I'm looking for a revealing of Jesus Christ. That's what everybody's looking for. They're not looking for a different religion. They're not looking for a new religious experience. They're looking for Jesus. Now, we feed them the religious experience, trying to get them to be satisfied with it, but they're not. Praise the Lord. I'm looking for Him today in my life. Last scripture, Matthew 12, 12 through and 13 again, where we started, Matthew 12, 12 and 13. How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. Then saith he to the man, stretch forth your hand. He stretched forth it, it was restored whole like the other. So today, every day, we need to be looking for the restored hand. We need to be looking for the move of the Holy Spirit. True ministry. Not how many scriptures you can quote. It's good to have the scriptures. It's good to be able to quote them. But it's about being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. That's what creates true ministry. Everything else is religion, and there may be some benefits to it. There may be some good qualities to it. But it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's the reason Jesus died, that he might be rise again, so that the Spirit could come back. He said, it's to your benefit that I go away. Amen? I have to go away so that I can send back the Holy Spirit that can lead you and guide you into all truth, that can give you true ministry. The ministry that Jesus had on this earth was the ministry of the Spirit. He said, the words that I speak to you, they're not just intellectual words. They are spirit and they are life. They will change a life. Amen? Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I'm so grateful to God to remind us from time to time of what he really wants to do. There's nothing wrong with teaching. There's nothing wrong with giving uh, 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 spiritual information and, and insight when we do that with one another in Bible studies or however we uh, do it. But the reason for that is to make us aware, to cause us to be conscious of this Holy Spirit that's in us that wants to lead us and guide us, that wants to do the ministry. The other stuff is preparation. It's the Holy Spirit that restores the withered hand that brings ministry into a place where it can be effective and impacting in other people's lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.